So thank you all for making yourselves available to join this panel session. Uh, this is a first for me on Zoom and for many of us as well, I imagine. So I wanna thank you for stepping out of your busy days today and spending some time with us on the Women in UDA panel, discussing the topic of the role of education, transparency and diversity in tackling bias in AI. Uh, before we introduce our panelists, uh, we are live in the chat. So if you have any questions, given this is a virtual forum, uh, we will be able to answer them directly in the chat which can be found below the video. Perhaps we can start today's session by quickly introducing ourselves. Um, I'll start with the panelists. Uh, alph alphabetically, Andrea, if you don't mind uh, kicking us off. Sure, hi everyone. Such a pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, so cool being here with you, at least online and in this way, talking about all this, uh, all these exciting topics. Um, so I'm a data engineer in uh, Limited Bank, a new paradigm bank based in Milan, Italy. Uh, we're working on leveraging um, open innovation, fintechs, big tech, trying to get, let's say, as much innovation as we can in small and medium enterprises, but also working on this credits and, of course, like um, a retail bank for like privates and let's say families. Uh, we've grown in the last year and a half to about 500 people now. Um, so that's kind of cool. Have people from 20 different nationalities. So we're working on diversity and different topics that also be discussing today. All right, Elisa. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Hi, I'm Elisa. I'm a machine learning engineer at QB. I actually have a background in econometrics, but uh, currently at QB, I work for a data team. And uh, at QB, we make data-driven services for households uh, that basically uh, help them to save as much energy as possible. Great, uh, very, very glad to have you here. Um, who would like to go next? So uh, I'm um, Estelle Laurent. I am a data scientist at uh, Bouygues Travaux Public. So it's a civil works uh, industry. Uh, and uh, I work in, I, I'm part of the innovation team. So we work uh, on the part of big data and also innovation in uh, some tunnels works. So in the, for the metro line and so on. And Marais. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, thank you all for joining us today. So my name is Marisa. I work as the solutions architect at Databricks, which essentially means that I um, help our customers making the most out of their data, um, ensuring that they can utilize the data, analyze it, and ultimately get value from this data from their business for their business. And, and my name is Christopher. Uh, I'm director of value acceleration uh, for EMEA at Databricks. Uh, my home office is based in the beautiful city of Amsterdam, so not too far from from a couple of the panelists on today's session. Um, you know, I'd like to thank everyone again uh, to, for joining us today. We have a, a bit of a diverse panel, different countries, uh, different backgrounds joining us. Um, obviously, the topic today is, is one that is, is, is quite important within our industry. So without further ado, I would like to just jump into the questions um, and start, um, start with uh, the first topic around education. So for several years now, AI has been viewed by non-professionals as potentially dangerous, whether it's Hillary Clinton or Elon Musk. A lot of high profile thinkers of our generation have challenged that AI could potentially pose a threat to civilization. Uh, Musk was actually quoted as saying, artificial intelligence is the biggest risk that we face as a civilization. We work in this industry, so perhaps we have a different perspective, uh, but the reality is over 81% of respondents to a recent USA Today survey said that super intelligent AI would do more harm than good. Uh, I would like to open it up to this panel. Uh, what is your take? Um, on what is driving the continued fear of AI and what can we do as AI professionals to address it? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can make a start on that one. So I think it's, um, yeah, it, it sounds all quite um, dramatic and extreme, exactly the examples that you hear in the news, like ones that Chris just described. Um, and that is also normal, right? News always really hypes the things that can go wrong, the instances where maybe AI made a mistake or was flawed. Um, and that's also something we should think about and I think, um, you know, take the people along with. So that the fear exists in society among the crowd is something that, um, you know, can be uh, basically been blown up by the news um, and also by uh, concerns people have, what happens to their normal lives. Maybe they will lose their jobs, uh, what they see maybe in dystopian kind of movies, is that actually real? Um, 
I think that's something we as professionals should think about because I think also as professionals, we sometimes have a fear of AI. And I think uh, very concretely, that means that professionals should always fear that they don't um, you know, thought well about all the side effects that their AIs have that were not intended, although they had, they had the best intentions, so to say. I, I would agree with that answer. I think one thing to add there is that, I, I mean, you're absolutely right in saying that the uh, media does play a part in um, inflating maybe some of the effects of AI and some of the fear in society around it. Um, I think another large part of that and why that happens is ignorance of the general population. Um, so the question, what is AI, what does it do from its very simple beginnings to maybe the most advanced versions is something that we don't really talk about. We only talk about the results and about how little we know. Uh, whereas I think there's definitely a role for uh, any data professional, regardless of their background, um, company or, or purpose really in the, in the role they have in the day to day life of, of sort of explaining what AI is, um, how it works um, and why it may or may not be something that can be flawed or may or may not impact uh, in people's daily lives. Uh, I agree with that. I, I think uh, I share with, with you that uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding with uh, AI and also that um, some people can think that it's just a black box with some magical things, mathematical things. And I think as professionals, we need to explain uh, as much as possible uh, our results, how we get them. And, and also we are uh, very responsible of uh, the conclusion that uh, the stakeholder and people and user can take with them uh, from our results. So Marais, uh, you, you mentioned that media inflates the risk uh, associated with some of the work um, that we do. How, how do we as professionals, um, what can we do to hedge against that, that media's inflation? Do we have any responsibility um, in the industry in, in regards to transparency um, or whatever else is, is potentially possible to, to help the general public understand. And I think this touches to your point, Estelle, uh, you know, so we need to explain more clearly what we actually do. What can we do to make sure that, that understanding actually is, 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 is transparent and, and well communicated? Well, for, for my part, uh, my day-to-day -day work is that I try very well to explain the algorithm, even for the people are not very fond of or very familiar of mathematics and informatics in general. Um, I try to explain them uh, how I open it. And uh, I think this is uh, the art of, uh, of uh, the fear of AI. If we don't explain this kind of, um, of algorithm, if we just, uh, uh, go uh, go away and just uh, say, okay, I use uh, this kind of algorithm, so some kind of clustering, for example. Um, I think we just um, uh, well, I don't know how to say um, well, uh, just to feed uh, the magic box uh, if we don't explain that. So for me, it's very important to uh, take some time. Uh, even if it's uh, long or even if it's uh, you need to repeat yourself, uh, but I think it's very important to, to do that. Sure. So yeah, I completely agree that transparency is one of the things that we can definitely do, do and try to, let's say, bring closer some of the, the more tech topics to some of our non-tech friends or, let's say, colleagues. Um, because it is, easy, it is easy to say, like, yeah, look, it's very difficult. I can't explain it to you, but I think everything can be explained in layman's terms. So if you just say, look, this model takes this as an input, does this, this, and this, explaining in very simple steps, you educate these people that go on and educate even more people. So we get rid of the, the ignorance and the fear that comes out of the ignorance, I think. Yeah, true. And, and also what we do at my company, for instance, is the data team works a lot together with the user experience team. So basically, if there is an AI model underlying a particular service or feature that the users get in their app. Um, we always really collaborate first also with the user experience team to make them understand what we're doing and so that they can translate that into something that also the user then eventually will understand very well. So, so if it's so easy to do, what is, what is fueling this lack of transparency in your opinion? 
I think a lot of the time there still is a misunderstanding. So I think that even, you know, explaining things to people takes a lot of time. And a lot of the time, um, the explanation isn't actually what's valued. It's the accuracy matter at the end of the day, or, you know, how, how, how certain we are that a certain finding is correct. Um, so a lot of the time, as long as you, what I've seen in previous roles, as long as you get to a 90% accuracy level, a lot of business uh, end users might be happy um, without actually fully understanding what that is. But it's at the end of the day, all they need. So I think there's a bit of a, uh, maybe a responsibility from uh, people working with data to, uh, even if there's not an ask for any explanations to still um, um, to still make certain that they do give this explanation and they do make sure that they can at least um, be um, uh, that that they that they are they are certain that they have explained it regardless of whether there's an ask for explanation. So, Marius, we spoke about this in one of our last conversations. Do you, do you feel like we're we're over rotating to an extent on the importance of accuracy, uh, almost neglecting some of the other impacts that some of these these analytics might have on uh, users, for instance? Um, yeah, I think to some extent, right? So, I think that yeah, obviously, I mean, the easiest thing about to understand about any algorithm, and you know, be curious here from the other panelists as well. But I think the easiest thing to understand is whether something has a certain level of accuracy. All the other things that might impact how correct or how well an algorithm works are much harder to understand and also much harder to explain. So, and I think it's a very human thing to do to grasp for the easiest concept that's easiest to explain and easiest to understand to sort of ignore the, the other bits. Whereas, especially when talking about bias um, and some of the things that, that have gone wrong in the past with algorithms, um, they do relate back to, to harder concepts to understand. Um, such as, you know, is there a bias in the data? Um, what features actually do ex do make that a, that a model gets this accurate? Um, are these features biased in any way? Is there any sort of harm in, in taking those features? Um, so I think the, 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 the easiest way out in this case is probably the way out that that's giving us a lot of harm potentially um, mm -hmm. down the line. Yes, yeah, so to the matter of um, if accuracy is, is everything and the thing you should optimize for, I wonder because, um, oh yeah, I already said like uh, previously that we cooperate a lot with the user experience team as well. And I think um, sometimes uh, user experience maybe goes uh, up before accuracy optimizations because in the end, it's never a isolated model that reaches the end user or the, uh, well, the user in, in general. So um, I think you should always wonder um, despite maybe a particular accuracy, what does that mean for particular end users, the users that will get a, uh, a nice answer, and also for the users that will are in that um, on the wrong side of the metal, so are on the other side of the equation that actually are in the group that will get a, a bad answer or a wrong answer, or maybe are in that exactly that group for which the model is biased. What are the worst things that can happen? What is the experience of those users? So, um, yeah, at least I think it's always nice to keep a, a customer perspective on that, as actually with all great products, um, it's never really about, you know, the technology and and those kind of things. It's always about what does the user experience, what's the, what does that mean for our development, basically. Uh, Elisa, thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned uh, the word bias in your response. Um, you know, the argument has been made that the machines that we train see the same racial bias as the developers that program them. Um, struggles to accurately identify famous black female women through facial recognition technology, for example, has been very well documented. Um, we've also been confronted as a society with high profile cases of systematic racism in 2020. Uh, it, it really wouldn't be fair to host a panel on the societal risks of AI without addressing the elephant in the room, what causes AI bias? Is the problem the technology or is the problem the technologist? Yeah, that's a nice bridge you're making there, Chris. Um, but I think first of all, uh, also really interested to, interested, interested, but I'm also really interested to hear what the other fans have to say about that. But personally, I feel like the models are as biased as the developer programs them. I wonder if that's really fair to say, as in, uh, in the end, the technologists, they are not, AI is a technology where you don't per se program 
the AI to do particular things. You feed it with particular data to learn particular patterns that are out there in the real world. So at the core of this problem is basically the data that goes into these technologies. And of course, that is the responsibility of the technologist. But at the heart of the problem lies basically the data that goes into these uh, technologies, I would say. Yes, I, I share the, the thought of uh, the data. It's a major cause of, uh, of the bias as we live in the bias society. So uh, therefore, there is some bias in our data. And uh, this is, I share with us also that this is the technologist's responsibility to, well, we have, uh, as data scientists, have to clean the data and to select before to feed the algorithm. And this is the part uh, that is important to try to remove the bias. But uh, I think also that is important to ask ourselves, what do we want to do with uh, this kind of data? Because uh, we have one facet that is, can be very interesting is maybe, OK, there is some bias in our society and our data. But maybe we can use them to, well, uh, get some evidence of that uh, problem in our society. So it can be a positive way uh, to have some bias, and we can uh, draw some conclusion with that. But also, uh, it is important to make some cleaning uh, about the, the data we 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 use and also to be aware of the signification of our data. So yeah, I completely agree that it's technology's responsibility to check data before feeding into the model. So I have to check is my data skewed? Is it labeled uh, as it should be? Does it represent the real world? So if you say, for example, if I have the problem of recognizing a female uh, black face, like is my data, is my training data 90% uh male whites so if that's the case of course i'm not gonna label all of the the data correctly so it is definitely a technologist's responsibility to check the data beforehand i have two things to add i think so i agree with all that's been said before um so i do think it's the it's the technologist's responsibility to uh clean the data to an extent to make sure like you say that there's no skew that you know it's it's a representative society but we also need to be aware of the fact that there simply are biases in society that will be present in the data so do we then make it the responsibility of the technologist to decide what is a bias in our today's society and what's not or is that a wider debate that you know we should have guidance on in some way um and i think um the second point i wanted to make even if there is a bias in the data, the best way to recognize that bias, I think, is through the first team. So, you know, I'm I'm a white female. I might pick up on certain biases that someone else with a different background might not pick up on because you're simply not aware. So from that perspective also, I think it's very important to um, reflect the diversity that we see in our society and the teams that we have that, that work on data problems. Marijs, I think it's a really interesting thing you're saying there about basically that uh, cleaning that data and that bias that is there. But I think also the other panelists already said it a little bit, um, because the question here is as well, the, basically, we want the data to represent society maybe as close as possible. But the question is, do we want that? Or is there actually a role for AI to make the world a better place? As in, um, I think Estelle also already said it, it can um, recognize particular um, biases maybe there. Or was it Andrea? Well, one of you two said it. But um, the thing is, maybe we can actually use AI to first of all recognize these uh, biases that are there and then also propose a solution to them because there's techniques out there with which um, actually we can even automate recognizing the bias um, and then basically respond to that, both by cleaning the data, but also by um, well making the model in such a way so that it knows which kind of parameters and features it should and shouldn't use. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can actually, uh, instead of relying on the human bias in society that is uh, inherently there, maybe we can, in the years to come, make a society that is based on fair uh, AI-based decisions that don't discriminate because we made them as such. 
So Estelle, you brought up a really interesting topic around uh, positive discrimination. This this almost utopian um, idea that we can be driving good through through leveraging of analytics uh, to attack this this topic. Um, does anyone else have any any perspective on that? Yeah. So actually, this phenomena that Estelle is uh, describing there, basically uh, girls being chosen for a particular job because of being girls, that actually uh, happened to me once when I was pursuing a career in data science. So I was doing a couple of applications. And uh, what happened there was that uh, one of the jobs, uh, well, one of the positions I applied for, basically had my interview. And at the end, the interviewer said, well, you know, I'm not exactly sure I have some doubts, but you can have my, my, my benefits of my doubts because you're a lady. And that really, really put me off, so to say. So maybe a, a don't do for uh, hires out there. If you're looking to, um, you know, up the uh, uh, percentage uh, of women in your company, it's not by this kind of positive discrimination. Actually, I think it's by making them feel like one of the guys, as in treat and respect them for their knowledge and their skills and their personalities. And that's, I think, what all the ladies out there are looking for uh, in their career as well. Would, would, would the rest of the room agree with that? Is that is that if you could share a message with your male colleagues now now's now's a great opportunity to do it um what would you say how would you how would you react to that uh, i completely agree it's not being one of the guys just like being one of the team i mean i, I don't want to be treated differently because um i'm a woman that's basically it like treat me um like what you would have any other person based on my skills and what i've done but not better or worse because uh of my sex yeah, I, I entirely agree. Um, so don't yeah, treat everyone similarly, regardless of sex or background or anything. And I guess the final thing that the most, to me, the most harmful thing around positive discrimination, especially in the scenario that um, Elisa just highlighted or Estelle earlier, um, is around, you know, you undermine someone's confidence if you hire them for, uh, because they are from a certain background. Um, and you, you essentially tell them, right, I'm hiring you because you're from this background. They're going to think they're worse than someone else. Um, and they might perform worse. They might not take the job. They might quit early. They might decide on an entirely different career path if it's happened before. Um, and I think that it's ex extremely harmful to um, anything we're working towards in terms of diversity. That's really interesting. Are you um, between kind of the point around diversity of the teams doing the work as well as kind of the, the utopian perspective as, of AI actually being a driver of you know, breaking down this bias. Are you, is anyone actually on the panel seeing anything um, out there uh, in, in, in the world of data and AI that's giving us uh, encouragement that, you know, this is the direction that we're moving? Any, any examples that come to mind? I don't have any particular examples, but I think on the second point around the teams that work on AI, I think there definitely is a drive that you get from you know being involved with potentially hiring or other incentives that there is a drive to show and to create um, diversity in teams that work on AI. Um, so I think sort of the uh, the awareness around the importance of diversity is coming through, but that's a wider, I would say, a wider um, a move or drive in society. Also, something that comes to mind is actually a talk I've seen on the. On the keynotes, it was uh, last uh, Spark Summit, I think uh, in spring, there was actually uh, Microsoft explained their uh, fair learn uh, initiatives. So there's also a bigger company, so to say, uh, making standardized ways of uh, treating this kind of problems, which is, I think, really nice to see. I personally don't have experience using that tool, for instance, but um, there's also lots of open source tools out there which you can use to this extent. For instance, uh, at QB, we work with uh, the Python library Shep a lot, which helps you to um, interpret your model, why it made particular answers, why it made particular choices. Uh, I think these are really nice initiatives that well, all teams uh, can leverage mm. to better start understanding the bias in their models. So, I mean, this is the women, the women's panel. Um, and, you know, it's actually quite an interesting topic to get a female perspective on. Um, you know, I, I read some research recently that says 78% of, um, of, of our industry is male dominated. Right? And, and so, you know, very broad question, but, um, you know, what drives this lack of diversity? And, 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 you know, what can we actually 
do to proactively address it and make sure that we're breaking down these barriers? Well, I think that um, in our uh, domain, uh, big, big data, uh, there is no specific problem of um, well dominated uh, uh, industry. Uh, for me, it's more global. So uh, I come from science uh, background, so physics uh, in my in my past, uh, and I think this is the problem with all science. Uh, industry and uh, civil uh, engineering industry and also computer science and so on. So there is no very specificity about uh, about our industry, so AI and big data. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, uh, there is some maybe uh, some positive uh, value uh, in our industry uh, because uh, in, for example, data scientist, um, um, uh, we have uh, different aspects of our jobs uh, that can be interesting uh, and maybe can interest maybe more females to, to come uh, to this uh, kind of career. For example, we have a lot of communicative parts to share our results, to present the results. So this kind of little bit different of uh, than the other industry. Uh, and also to share about uh, maybe what I uh, as being a female in a male dominated industry is that uh, I, I didn't uh, feel that there is some negative uh, discrimination also on for, for me. But uh, I just want to, to point out that there is sometimes positive discrimination uh, that is, um, well, maybe there is a good intention in that, uh, maybe it's just the one sentence or so on, but uh, I think this kind of uh, positive discrimination, um, well, to say, for example, uh, we choose you, for example, to job interview, we choose you because you are in female and we need to have some more balance in our, in our uh, company, for example, uh, I think it's um, well um, not very good as uh, we we intend to. Uh, for example, uh, I feel like when there is some dis positive discrimination, but I uh, as I have been chosen only for being women, for example, and not for my skills, and this is a kind of a problem for me. So maybe not to focus uh, today on negative discrimination, but also to focus on the one which can be uh, harmful, even if we don't intend to. Interesting. Um, Andrea, I saw you nodding as well on the Zoom. Have you, have you, have you experienced something similar? Uh, no, what I wanted to say is, I think there are a few reasons that we have, uh, let's say not that, not that many women in STEM. Uh, the first of being society, I think, as women, it's more like, I don't know if it definitely depends on the side you grow up in, but are you more prone to going into, I know, medicine or education or something that's not a boys club, which is engineering? Um, mm -hmm. Another thing is maybe like when I was in high school, high school, but also university, I had no idea what I could do with my degree. I have a, a master's in biomedical engineering. I was like, okay, I'm going to work in a hospital, but um you never, I mean, I didn't have, let's say, an idea of what I could do with my degree. At the end, I finished as a data the data engineer slash data scientist in a bank, and it has nothing to do with what I studied. Um, and the third thing is, I think, the lack of role models. Just mm -hmm. I didn't have anybody, let's say, near me, say, uh, somebody that I could look up to and say, okay, look, this is what she's doing, so I can ask uh, about her path, what she studied, what she did which I think we are doing, I can see initiatives also. In Italy, our company, what we're doing, like we had a few talks to, for example, an astrophysicist or I don't know, like women in different career paths uh, that are explaining how they got there, what got them interested. And also all these like, I don't know, like uh, Instagram TV basically type of interviews where these, these, these ladies would come in and talk and the girls in I don't know, high school, university can ask questions and I think it just brings closer uh, 
the tech world and women and all the girls interested in it. Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting point. The only thing I would add, like I yeah, I agree with all of that, and I think it's very important that from a very from a younger age we we show role models and people in a technical field. I understand the point from um, Estelle around yet. Yeah, it's a problem across science and engineering. Um, but I think um, you know, so getting to uh, say a 50-50 uh, diversity men women in a in a male dominated sector is quite hard because the the pool of women we can tap from is quite small. Um, but equally, I think that uh, specifically for uh, the data industry um, and well other industries as well, depending on the on the requirements, I think you can also look at right. You know, there's there's loads of talented women out there um, who might have made a different decision when they were 16, 17, 18 from the decision they would make 10 years later once they once they're fully in, um, in the in sort of the uh, in their working lives. Um, is there a way that we can enable people to make a sidestep? Um, into a more technical role. So is there a way in which we can, at, even at a later age, encourage people to make a decision into, say, a more technical uh, role without having to go back to university for five years, which obviously, you know, going back to university for four, five, six years is also something that is often not possible anymore once you're close to 30, because you might have other priorities um, and, and responsibilities in your life. Uh, yeah, so one thing I've been hearing you guys say throughout the day is that um, AI is generally as diverse as the people that are powering it, right? So um, either, whether it's at a younger age, I think a lot of you mentioned almost getting interested in the career when you're when you're still going through your education, or Marais, your point to you know you don't actually have to be a data scientist by training to get into data science. Um, is is this is this the solution? Is this the underlying solution to diversity in our industry? Is by looking at you know the, the diversity of the people who are sitting behind the computers. I guess my question is: is it is it that simple? Is it simply by looking at different demographics of people that we can solve this problem of, of bias in, in data and AI. I think it's part of it, but it's also a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? If we, you know, we're saying if you have a more diverse workforce, you will attract more diversity in your workforce, but you know, you need to have one before the other, uh, but you need the other before the other one. So it's, you know, if there's more people interested, of course we, or we might be working towards a more diverse workforce, but equally, as long as we don't have that more diverse workforce, how are we going to attract uh, the diversity? And, and maybe on top of that, the question if that would then solve uh, the bias in AI itself, I think that's also, yeah, something that's debatable, as in, of course, it will help to solve it, but it will never completely solve it because we also need uh, basically the right tools and techniques to uh, basically conquer that bias. And that's regardless of who uses the tools. But it will be empowered and, and be made better, I think, if there's a uh, well, more diverse workforce in the first place to mm. do that. So before we go um, towards the end of the panel session today, I would like to go back to the conversation around companies and corporations and their role in making sure that there is this, this notion of equality and, and tackling the topic of bias in, in, in AI. Um, to dig a little bit more in on the corporate side of the discussion, uh, just to, again, a very general question. What role do companies actually have in ensuring that they're not employing uh, bias-based algorithms? What role do they have um, as, as essentially the proprietors of a lot of the, uh, the intelligence that's going out there of making sure that bias isn't prevalent in what they're producing or what their employees are producing? Well, I think it's kind of hard to, let's say, um, quantify bias or fairness. It's kind of hard to say, okay, this is 100% biased or 50% biased. It's a bit hard. But I think every step of the, let's say, the data science pipeline, the data processing pipeline, needs human input. So there needs to be a team, uh, a few people dedicated to looking at it and uh, having, having that input say, okay, this is biased or not biased or fair or not fair. So I think human input here is crucial. I think from my perspective, and I'm curious to hear everyone else's as well, I think you, you know, my my truth is going to differ from everyone else's truth on this panel. And that's going to, you know, be, be different from like, like was said, based on your maybe uh, economical background, on your, uh, where you come from, where you grew up, what your experience in life have been. Um, and I think what we, uh, ultimately what we're looking for also taking into account that we're saying, right, can, can algorithms determine certain biases in society? Can we see, um, can it, can it aid there? Ultimately, um, it's a decision that society needs to take together. So, um, I think I don't think we can make it the sole responsibility of the technologist or the sole responsibility of the company. Um, it's a shared responsibility. Um, yeah, which which might might sit uh, above a company level, if you if you see what I mean. But yeah, that 
yeah, I think it's a very hard question because there's so many different uh, sides to it. Yeah, but there's definitely a lot of sides to it because um, if you think of actually regulations, um, yeah. you can even think of lots of examples where uh, fairness regulations could even possibly contradict each other or are not, you know, um, they're not possible to have at the same time. Mm -hmm. For instance, companies optimizing something for their particular users versus something that is kind of okay for everybody out there. Uh, yeah, what do you choose? Yeah. There, is, um, there is a counter argument as well that regulation requires a certain level of transparency. It re requires companies almost to give up their IP to an extent because you have to allow regulators to see behind the curtain. Now, the, the good associated with that I think is, is, is obvious, but is, is that a fair expectation for companies to say, you know, tell us what you're doing to create this competitive advantage? I'm not exactly an expert in that field, but what I would think is that there's a lot of things that um, actually can be uh, basically audited or uh, monitored without basically uh, putting out there the IP of a particular company. Because um, maybe it's not necessary that all companies tell exactly how their algorithm, their machine learning works, but maybe it's fair to uh, be transparent about uh, the kind of outcomes their AI has and the kind of input their AI has and these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, potentially also coming back to a framework like SHAP, which might give a certain level of explainability. So rather than giving away IP, can we explain where that outcome came from? Um, and can we make be transparent around at least that bit of, this, of, the, of the solution that any company might employ? Yeah, thank you again. Um, we're almost out of time. So before wrapping up, I, I would like to play a quick uh, word association game. I'm going to call out a few themes from today's session. And if you could maybe just summarize your point of point of view on the, the future of AI as it relates to this topic in one or you know, a, a couple of words. Um, you know, please throw out whatever comes to mind. This is a, this is a, a Zoom COVID experiment. So you know, bear with me. Um, you don't, of course, have to answer if you don't want to. Um, and I guess just to keep it simple, maybe um, Andrea, then Estelle, then Elisa, then Marais. So we can maybe not all talk at the same time. Um, so the, 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 first, uh, the first word, the first sentence is, um, is educating the public around the risk of data and AI. A couple of words, how you'd react to, to that. Um, I would say absolutely necessary. And the word that comes to mind is transparency. So as we said before, um, being transparent and trying to uh, bring our jobs, our worlds closer to the people that are not as close to it is, is definitely um, necessary. If we wanna have, let's say, less fear and less ignorance in general. Um, for me, it's uh, maybe on one, one word, uh, explanation. So give uh, an explanation about our works, about AI and data and what we, we can do with that and how we do that. For me, it would be cooperation, as in within your company, cooperate with everybody, uh, all your colleagues to basically get the best possible out there for the end user. That is really understandable. And for me, it's being transparent. So ensure that you uh, are transparent around what you've built, how you've built it, um, and make sure that you can explain this um, in a transparent fashion. Um, second round, the, 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 the trigger is bias in AI. Mm, yeah, the word that comes to mind is audit, something that I think Elisa mentioned earlier. So having um, that human input, having uh, everything that we do audited, uh, by the company, by the regulators, whatever it is, so let's say to, to try and eliminate the bus and be fair in what we what we bring and what we create. Mm, I don't have it in one word, so I would just make a one sentence. Uh, maybe to uh, know how uh, what do you want to do with uh, your data, and then to take some time to clean the data and try to, to be fair in, in uh, your analysis. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, a bit bigger here. I'm going for hope. And that's because I believe that also AI can be a tool to basically, uh, well, maybe end human bias that's inherently there and uh, recognize it using AI. 
we need to we need to essentially work together and rise to the challenge. Um, I think there's a role to play for a lot of people in, in ensuring that the bias in AI is at least very limited. All right. So hope, hopeful feedback from the panel. It's it's very positive. I'm glad to hear that. Um, right, last last trigger um, before we wrap up. If you had one word or just a couple of words um, for young women considering a career in AI, what would you say? Be courageous. Don't conform to what other people <laughs> want from you. If, you. if you're interested in something, go for it. Look for role, role models, uh, talk to people, look them out online, put it on, like, just get informed. Like, don't not do something just because you're scared or uh, because other people don't expect it from you. For me, it's uh, come and join us. Uh, there's so much fun in our in our work and our jobs, and you can choose every field you want to study. So, uh, what what more for for your career than uh, than our our industry? I'm gonna add a little bit to Estelle here. Also, um, well, in the frame of join us, I think that our field really benefits from having uh, not only diversity uh, from all kinds of sorts. Uh, gender diversity, uh, minority diversity, but also from study background diversity, because it all brings something to the data science. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree with all of that. So my, my main work would be go for it, um, come talk to us, uh, explore, try out, um, you know, make, dare to make the step, and I'm sure you'll, you'll have a great time. Um, it's such a diverse role, you can do so many different things, um, so many things to, to work on, uh, yeah what not to like. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us on this panel. Thank you, uh, ladies, for taking time out of your day uh, to join us on the Data and AI Summit European Edition. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you as well for your very interesting uh, experience, personal experience uh, and insight, perspectives, opinions on, on this, you know, this very important topic. Um, so yes, thank you once again. If, if we were in a, an audience or a, a giant hall right now, we'd be applauding you. But um, you know. It is 2020 after all. So next up um, is at 1 p.m. GMT. There will be a keynote um, from Dr. Radinsky. Uh, so we encourage everyone tuning in uh, to join it. Please head to the live agenda on the left navigation and click the 1 p.m. keynote listen, uh, listing to join. Thank you once again, uh, everyone. Have a great summit. Thank you. Thank you for having us.